So this one's pretty interesting here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jake Tapper is actually giving some criticism for Kamala Harris's debate speech or debate performance himself. I was actually surprised by this. Not only does he give that criticism, but he also brings in Bernie Sanders to pretty much back him up on his criticism, which I thought was kind of strange. Uh, before I get to that clip though, there's another one here I wanna show you. Another warning to Kamala Harris. So it's interesting, right? Like we had RFK giving a warning to Donald Trump and now we have commentators giving warnings to Kamala Harris. Let's dive into this clip here. She is the worst polling Democrat against Donald Trump in history on national polls. No one is performing worse than her. No one's performing worse than her among blacks, among Hispanics, the worst performing Democrat in modern history among those demographics, <clears throat> worst performing polling wise among Jews. She is losing key factions of the Democratic base. Muslim voters, she's at under 50, she's at 52% in the latest care poll among black Muslims. She is not doing well. We're, we're, she is the worst polling Democrat against Donald Trump in history on national polls. No one is performing worse than her. No one's performing worse than her among blacks, among Hispanics, the worst performing Democrat in modern history among those demographics, <coughs> worst performing polling wise among Jews. She is losing key factions of the Democratic base. Muslim voters, she's at under 50, she's at 52% in the latest care poll among black Muslims. She so this is a problem for Kamala Harris. It is a reality. And I think all the hype around her, the media has not been addressing this. So this guy here, he is uh, J.D. Vance's Senate campaign or former, excuse me, former J.D. Vance Senate campaign staffer. So he's no longer with working with uh, J.D. Vance anymore. But He's talking about the demographics that Kamala Harris is struggling with when you compare her to Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton. Now, again, Hillary Clinton still lost, but when you look at the numbers, Hillary Clinton was still performing better with the black population than Kamala Harris, and so was Joe Biden. So that is a cause for concern for Kamala Harris's, I would, I would hope to say her team, because they're seeing these numbers just like you see these numbers, okay? So there's that. She's also not polling as well with Latino voters as Biden and Hillary Clinton did this same time as well. And then we have to bring in Muslim voters now, right? Because obviously things have definitely flipped since October 7th and a large part of the Muslim population, Biden was able to capture. And now things have changed because this administration is funding and aiding the genocide. Now you're gonna see all of these, if you go onto Twitter right now, you will see a lot of Kamala's doing this. Kamala's doing that positive things about her campaign and look at the crowd of people that showed up to see her. You're gonna see all of that, but they're not talking about this. And they're also not talking about something I'm gonna show you when we get to the Jill Stein Breakfast Club story, these internal numbers that I just saw. So this is why I say, the national poll that they're showing you and the swing state polls that they're showing you right now, you also have to factor in key demographic groups that the Democratic Party needs to win. So always take that with a grain of salt, right? And now it just goes to Jake Tapper because even Jake Tapper, he's having criticism about Kamala Harris's debate performance. So I think they're trying to send a message to Kamala for her not to get too comfortable because the numbers still aren't turning out the way that they should if we compare her campaign to Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton at this same time when they were running. Listen to this. Sanders from Vermont. Senator, thanks so much for joining us. The first question Vice President Harris was asked in the debate last night was if she believed Americans are better off now. We know that young families need support to raise their children, and I intend on extending a tax cut for those families of $6,000, which is the largest child tax credit that we have given in a long time. I love our small businesses. My plan is to give a $50,000 tax deduction to start up small businesses, knowing they are part of the backbone of America's economy. How satisfied were you with that response, Senator? Well, I think it's a step forward. I think more has got to be done. Small business should be the backbone uh, of the American economy. Many of them are hurting right now, and a tax break uh, would be a real help. Uh, but I think we've got to do more. She also mentioned the need to address 
the housing crisis in America, which I'll tell you, Jake, is severe in Vermont and all over this country. People can't afford housing. Three million new housing units is what she wants. That is the right thing to do. Uh, I think she has talked about passing the PRO Act, which makes it easier for workers to join unions, earn better wages and benefits. That is very, very important. But I think there's a number of other things that I would hope that she speaks about. And that is to understand that in America today, some 60% of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. You got half of elderly people living on $30,000 a year or less. What do we have to do? In my view, and I hope she speaks to these things, very popular ideas. You have to increase, expand social security benefits by lifting the cap on taxable income. Widely popular. Strong majority Republicans, Democrats support it. We can raise benefits for Social Security beneficiaries by $2,400 a year. Medicare expansion all over the country. Elderly people can't afford dental, hearing, vision. You expand that, we can get great support and it's good policy. Uh, we have got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. I would say let me pause. Notice how Bernie Sanders is now saying expand medical, right? No more Medicare for all. Just it's now just expand. So just pay close attention to that. Right. Um, this is Bernie Sanders and Jake Tapper sending a message to Kamala Harris that the platform that she has is not aggressive enough to determine that she's going to be able to have an outright, you know, blowout win. Because right now she can't say that. Uh, it's still very close. And considering everything that happened during Donald Trump's presidency that really turned off even some Republicans, it shouldn't be this close. You see what I mean? So this is Bernie Sanders and Jake Tapper trying to tell her, listen, you need to add some other things or change some things here. He mentioned minimum wage. She has that on her platform to increase it, but she never put a dollar amount. And that to me was very suspect. I told you guys about that. Really, after everything that's been said about $15, which is just the, the minimum, minimum baseline, it should be more than that based on inflation. You couldn't even put 15 so just again, like I said, I think Kamala Harris is an empty suit. I don't think she really knows what she's doing. I think that she is an empty suit that is going to be the person that's in front of you. But I think the decisions will be made by the Obamas and the Clintons. I think that's how it's going to be, because I don't I don't think that Kamala's ready for this. She wasn't prepared to really do the border job. And we see how that turned out. Right. So listen to this. Uh, we have got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage i would say 17 bucks an hour it's so you notice how he had to see notice how the numbers change notice how it's no longer 15 now it's, it's 17. so this is bernie trying to give her you know like why does he have to tell you that it's not acceptable so many of our people working for 12 14 bucks an hour i think what we have also got to do is recognize that we have massive income and wealth inequality and yes billionaires are going to have to start paying their fair share of taxes. I think some of those issues are what she has got to start talking about. She's talking about some of them. Child tax credit, very important, lowering child and poverty. But she's got to do more if we're going to win over Trump's supporters who know that he's a liar, know that he has no agenda. But you got to give them something to say, you know what, life will be better under the vice president. So it's, it was interesting in both um uh, 2016, uh, when you ran for president, and 2020, when you ran for president, Donald Trump ran those years as well. There was an interesting overlap uh, where there were people who supported you, and then when you did not get the nomination, uh, they were more attracted uh, by Donald Trump's message. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but in an election this close, uh, any any uh, vote uh, in, especially in battleground states, is, is significant. Do you think that there's anything more that she needs to do beyond those policy issues you talked about, which are obviously important to your voters? Is there something stylistically like that she needs to do? Is there something message wise that she needs to do yeah. that she isn't doing? See, they're trying to coach her. This is their way of trying to coach her. Now, she may not watch this segment with Jake Tapper, but I'm pretty sure someone that's a part of her campaign team, they're probably watching all of the press that's coming out about Kamala Harris to give this information back to her, right? But they're trying to they're trying to coach her and tell her, like, listen, you need to do these things. Otherwise, you know, you don't have it in the bag.
Yeah, Jake, I think here's the message, and, and it's a message that I know it's difficult for many politicians to bring forth, and that is the recognition that increasingly the United States is moving toward an oligarchic form of society. The economy is very clear what's going on right now. The billionaire class and the 1% have never, ever had it so good, period, end of discussion. More income and wealth inequality than any time in American history. Tens of millions of people, working people, struggling to put food on the table. That is the reality. It's not Kamala Harris's fault, it's not Joe Biden's fault, not Donald Trump's fault. It's been that way for a long time, getting worse. But you know what? You've got to recognize that. And then what you've got to say is, look, working people of America, I am on your side. And I am prepared to take on the billionaire class, including these wealthy campaign contributors who right now are dominating the political process. In other words, among other things, we got to get rid of the Citizens United doctrine, which allows billionaires to buy elections. So in other words, I think you've got a working class that is hurting that I think is turning to Trump only because they don't see real alternatives. Let me pause. She can't say that. She can't say that we got to go against the billionaires because they're on her side. She's taking money from billionaires. She's publicly announced this. She told you during the debate that her and Goldman Sachs are like this. They're on her side. So she can't do that, Bernie. You were able to do that because you ran a grassroots campaign. She's not running a grassroots campaign. So those billionaire donors that she got, the Wall Street people who are backing her, they are going to turn against her the moment she starts saying we have to go after the billionaires. So you see, this is how I say, look, Bernie wants her to say things that are not true. And it just it he thinks that if she says some of the things that he said, then she'll be able to create the same amount of excitement uh, that Bernie had around his campaigns. And that's just not the case, bruh. Too much has happened. When you were running for president, we didn't have the war with Russia and Ukraine. When you were running for president both times, we didn't have, you know, uh, October 7th. Yes, Israel was still attacking Palestinian people but it has increased significantly since October 7th, including the expansions in the West Bank. We didn't have all this. And, and that's, that's the difference. So just getting up on a stage and saying, we gotta go after the billion, that's not enough, fam. That's not enough. The level's up here now, okay? So like when you ran, who we were like right here, you know, you're saying some things, we're like, yeah, that's cool, we need Medicare for all, et cetera. But now the stakes are higher. The bar is higher. So the typical Bernie campaign, that's not enough anymore. The economy is worse. But he just wants her to say these things because he thinks, well, you got to get the Trump people to think that you're going to feel you're going to do something for them and then not do those things because she's not going to do those things. All vibes. And I think if she gives them an economic alternative that says, I am going to stand for you, I'm going to take on these greedy people who want it all, I think she could turn some Trump people around and win this election, maybe win it big. <clears throat> no, but, but she can't. She can't turn on those. She can't turn on those corporations. She can't turn on those donors. She can't turn on those investors because they're funding her. That's the difference. Take a listen to something we heard. <coughs> Pardon me. Take a listen to something we heard from an undecided voter in Erie, Pennsylvania, in a focus group we did there last night after that voter watched the debate. When Trump was in office, the economy was higher, inflation was lower, things were better overall. Now with um, Kamala's administration, things haven't been so fantastic. And she's saying she can fix the problems that her administration has caused, but I just don't know if I can afford to take that risk. Mm -hmm. The Pennsylvania, obviously a must, must win battleground state this year. What would you say to that voter? So notice how, notice how the rhetoric is changing around the states that they need to win. Remember before they were saying that they have to win Michigan. Now they're saying they must win Pennsylvania. What does that tell you guys? 
That tells you that they're not guaranteed. They don't, they're not banking on Michigan. That tells you that they're willing to say, okay, maybe we won't get Michigan. But they weren't saying that before that they must get Pennsylvania. Now they're saying they must get it. Help me out. I didn't quite clearly hear it. The sound is not so great here. Okay, no problem. So it, it, uh, the voter said when Trump was in office, the economy was higher, inflation was lower, things were better well, overall. Uh, and under the Biden Harris administration, things haven't been so fantastic. Not well, sure that she can, that Harris can fix the problems that her yeah. administration caused, this voter said. Well, obviously, in my view, you know, given the fact that uh, Biden and Harris came in in the midst of this terrible pandemic, when, as you recall, unemployment was soaring, small businesses were going out of out of business, workers were not going to work. We had a major public health crisis. I think that Biden and Harris did an excellent job, by the way, in getting our economy back on track in a way that economists did not even think possible. So I think they did a good job. But her point is well taken in the sense that the economy today is an economy where working class people are struggling. That is absolutely true. And what we have got to do is not just demonize undocumented people, which is Trump's mantra, but have the guts to talk about the greed of the people on top, people who fight workers when they try to organize unions, people prepared to shut down factories in this country and move them to Mexico or China, people who want massive tax breaks, want to cut Social Security and Medicare. Do we have a political system today where members of Congress are prepared to stand up to these big money interests? And I think if we do that, she will understand that it's not Trump who's going to deliver for her or Kamala Harris. And I'm sorry. I have to say something for just a second. Just because you say that we have this corruption at the top, that doesn't help people economically right now. Like Bernie, you've been saying that for years. So saying it and fixing the problem are two different things, right? I'm gonna tell you guys, I was at the store earlier today and I'm like, I get to the register and I'm like, seriously? Like when I hear the price, I'm like, what? Like, are we, are we serious? I have three things, I have three items. Why am I paying $40? So th this whole idea of just talk about the greed at the top, no, you can't just talk about the greed. If you don't have a plan, to make it so that the corporate money has to be removed from electoral politics. Otherwise, this is never going to change because the politicians, most of the time, don't pass legislation unless it has some type of corporate interest attached to it. So everybody understand that. So there's that problem. Two, you cannot continue to string the American people along all these years by just talking about the corruption. You are in office. You got to fix it. And I don't want to hear that you can't fix it because you guys got billions for Ukraine. You have billions for Israel. When it comes to us, we're the ones that you want to shortchange. We're the ones that you say, we don't, oh, we can't make housing affordable. We're the ones that get screwed over. So that's not enough. That's not enough. And I'm going to tell you another damn thing. When you listen to this group of women here on this panel, group of black women talking about Kamala Harris, and they're going to let you know that it's not enough for them either. And this whole, you know, hey, she's coconut vibes, brat summer theme, which is not as trendy anymore as it used to be that honeymoon period. That's not enough for them. It's not enough to see pictures of Kamala Harris and some coconuts and, and all this jazz. It's not enough to have this endorsement from Taylor Swift and people like, well, Taylor endorsed her. Yay. That doesn't put food on people's table. It's not enough anymore. And you're going to hear it from other black women who are also going to let you know that they see that Kamala Harris is trying to pander to the black community. Listen to this. Race baiting and fear mongering was a big part of her tactic tonight. Part of Kamala's tactic. Yes, Kamala's tactic. Okay. What in particular is gonna, would you remember about that? Especially when she brought up the Central Park Five, I think that's a hot button issue, especially for a lot of African Americans, but she leaves out a lot of specifics to that. Like the lead prosecutor was a Democrat at the time. Mm. Back then, Donald Trump was also a Democrat. He wasn't always a Republican. 
and he was praised heavily in a good way for taking out that ad in the paper because a lot of people did think that they were guilty. So a lot of people that were against Trump now were once a big fan of his and I think he was gaslit during the entire debate and that was probably why he was so defensive. Yes. And even when he brought up the topic of race, he brought that up because she's pandering. She's using being black as a trope to get the black vote, I'm sorry. But instead of her leaning into it, I would have liked to see her lean into the fact that, yes, I am a black woman and this is my plan for black America, but she mm. clearly doesn't have a plan because she's essentially not black. But she used that as a moment to paint him as a racist. Right. So I feel like this, too. If you're going to run on, hey, I'm a black woman, could be the first black woman president or whatever and all that kind of jazz. But you don't have a black agenda. How are you going to run on that and you don't have a black agenda? Yeah, you know, it just, it, it don't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me at all.